Thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope, can you hear me okay? Great. I can't see everyone, so um, apologies if I can't see you, but I'm going to try sharing a screen to bring the slides up. So hopefully everyone can see the um, slides now. Can you see them? Yep. Is that all right, Yasmin? Great. Thank you. So um, what I'm going to be looking at today um, is uh, obviously I put a disclaimer up first of all and I will confess that with these slides I had originally built them so that little bits come in one by one and then I try to get rid of those with the help of my teenage daughter obviously and anyway I managed not to have saved those so we're in the old version but um, just so I'll be building them as we go through and showing you um, hopefully you can see where we are apologies because I'm looking at my second screen and not at you so what I'm covering today when I'm talking is obviously thinking about issues for business owners and obviously even if you're not a business owner why you should have a will and we'll take questions at the end of that section and then looking at lasting powers of attorney for business owners. So looking first of all at what is a will um, the will is a formal legal document and as it's saying on the slide it says basically what happens to all your estate so everything you own when you die so you can have as many versions of a will as you like and as long as all the formalities have been complied with so for example it's written on paper we still don't have electronic versions of wills nor do we have electronic signatures at the minute so even with covid I know there's been discussion in the professional community about is there an easier way of signing wills? The answer is no still at the minute. You have to actually sign your will and have two witnesses. But obviously in the will process, that would be something that we would help you with. But this document, as I say, only becomes binding when you've died. So if I did a will today, leaving everything that I had to Yasmin, and then tomorrow I've fallen out with Yasmin, I think, well, I don't want to leave her anything. I can do a new will and I revoke the one to Yasmin and I do a new one giving everything to Stuart. So the will will evolve and change. So if you think, well, how do I know what's good now? I want to change it in the future. The answer is you do what you want now and then in the future you change it. So that explains position. So people sometimes say well what if i don't have a will now of course i may be talking to the people who all do have wills but just so that you're aware for if you don't have a will or to tell friends and family if they're interested we have a backup system and that's called the rules of intestacy and these are there simply as a backup for if someone hasn't made a will and that says who will inherit all your assets, so your money in your bank account, your shares, your partnership interest, whatever it might be, your home. And these rules are fixed. So you don't get to say who has anything. And in a moment, I'll go through what those rules are, but you don't get to say. If you want to have a, a voice and say who gets it, then you need to do a will. So for example, and I've got um, a particularly difficult case at the minute with the unmarried partner they weren't married but they'd been together 40 years under intestacy she gets nothing um, the house did pass to her because it was held in a particular way but all the other assets are going to family quite widely spread so we're trying to get them to agree that they will give their interest up but quite obviously some of them are saying well no it's my money so I'm not doing so unmarried partners unless you do a will won't get anything. So the idea of a common law spouse means nothing legally if you die. So friends wouldn't get anything, stepchildren wouldn't get anything, charities, so none of them benefit unless you make a will and obviously you name them. And you also, with intestacy, you don't get to choose who administers your estate. So the people who carry out the formalities, either by instructing solicitors or they do it themselves. So um, I've put a slide up, which I know is probably going to be quite hard for you all to see. But if I just talk you through it, what we have is you kind of do follow a flow chart. So 
if someone dies, first question is, well, are you or were they married or in a civil partnership? It has to be a registered civil partnership or registered marriage. So common law, as I said, doesn't mean anything. So if the answer to that is yes, they were married or in a civil partnership, then, and the figures have changed from the 6th of February, it's now £270,000. If the assets in total are worth less than £270,000, then the spouse will get everything. But if it's worth more than £270,000, then you ask more questions. So I'm down at the bottom of the table. And if there are children, then the spouse will get the first 270,000 the household contents and then half of everything else. So if there's a half million pound estate, they would get half of 230,000 and the other half of that 230 would then go to the children. So particularly where you have younger clients where their children are underage or even if their children are older, you will not want everything going on first death or something going on first death to the children. So that's just an example of where even if you have, you know, traditional um, couple married children, it may not be appropriate. So you need to do a will to do something about that. So the children don't get half of the balance outright. Now it gets a bit more convoluted, which is why in my example, um, we have got the, the couple weren't married, you then go and you say, well, are there any children? And if there are children, so for example, if you have um, a person whose wife has already died and then they die, then they wouldn't have a spouse unless they'd remarried or formed a new civil partnership. You say, well, are there any children? And if there are, the children get it. And if one of the children had also died before you, then it's their children who would get their share. So it goes, it splits down through the family tree, down through the bloodline. If there are no children at all or no grandchildren, then it will go to your parents if they're still living. Or if only one of them, it would go to them. If no parents, then it goes to brothers and sisters, firstly of the whole blood and then the half blood. Um, and then it will go down also to their children if one of them's died before you. After that, you look for grandparents. Then you look for aunts, uncles of the whole blood. And if you have absolutely no family, it goes to Prince Charles. So usually when I say Prince Charles is going to get it unless you do something, that gets people running to the solicitor to get a will drawn up because we probably think that Prince Charles has got enough. So... I apologise that that table's small and you can't see it, but hopefully that's run through what the rules are. So reasons to make a will, peace of mind that your wishes are fulfilled, because I'm not sure that many of you watching will have thought that that table of intestacy rules, yeah, that's fine, that's what I want. So it also obviously provides certainty to your family for after you've died, and the contents of your will are personal and private to you, but if you've said, yes, I've done a will and I've made provision for you, or you don't even have to say you've made provision, then that means that they know that they're going to potentially get something. And I'm not covering contentious estates today. So I say you had an adult child you didn't want to make provision for. I'm not covering that, but that is something that obviously is a consideration. And on a specific basis, we'd go through with you. So another reason, particularly for business owners to make a will, is so that the voting rights of any business shares, if you hold shares in a company, can be exercised by the people you appoint, so your executors, rather than it being any beneficiary. So it could be the spouse if it's intestacy, it could be your children, it could be your aunt, it could be your parent. So you have no control over who does the voting or has the voting rights if it's business shares unless you put that, you name someone in a will as an executor. And obviously you're making sure that the people you want benefit rather than those rules of intestacy. And it's also worth, when you're thinking of a will, we would have conversations with you. For example, if there are blended families, so second marriages or second relationships, you've got children by different relationships, or there are vulnerable in individuals or underage beneficiaries, there's a lot to think about and cover to do with, well, do you want to trust in there so that a person doesn't get the money outright? Or um, if you have, for example, 
it's a second marriage, do you want your new spouse to have the right to live in the house, for example, during their lifetime, and their death, you control where the money goes to. So you control that the capital that's left would go to your own children or all of your children, but it doesn't go to new wife for her to go to John Lewis or go on a cruise and spend as she likes or whatever it might be. And a very good reason to do a will is to think about saving inheritance tax. Um, so obviously I don't have time today to go through the tax rules in detail because that can take quite a long time, but potentially you can save up to £200,000 or more <clears throat> if you speak to someone who knows what the inheritance tax rules are and what the exemptions and reliefs are and also can advise on how you can fit that into your will provisions. So then if I've convinced you to do a will, thinking about what you should think about, first of all, um, if you have underage children, it's very important to think about guardians. Now, the guardians will be appointed on the death of the second parent. So if, for example, you have an underage child with the previous spouse, then you and the previous spouse, your ex, have parental responsibility unless the cool court rather has decided that one of you doesn't. But if you have joint parental responsibility on the death of the first of you, the survivor just carries on with that parental responsibility. But you can appoint a guardian so that on the death of the second of you, that's who you would like to act as the guardian. And of course, your ex might well have appointed someone else too. So that needs thinking about. You might, in a will, want to think about cash legacies or gifts of personal items, of course. And particularly talking to people who have business assets, an important consideration is do you want to have a trust which just sits there to take assets which qualify for business property relief? Now, that's something I could spend a lot more time going into, but I'm conscious that time is running away from us. And if I'm going to keep up to time, um, then I might have to skip some of that. But essentially, it then feeds into, do you want the spouse, so say it's husband and wife, do you want your wife to receive everything? Because if you, that would then mean that they would receive the business shares <clears throat> or the partnership interest. Whereas you might say, well, no, I want them to receive the cash from that. So you need preemption rights in your mem and arts or your shareholders agreement, or you need provision in your shareholders agreement so that that interest is bought out and that is then kept in this separate trust and then the money can be used for the spouse it can be used for children it can be used for wider family but you've got assets initially into a trust at nil inheritance tax cost so that is something to think about particularly um, also up there is the nil rate band amount and thinking about having a trust of that it depends obviously on values but if everything passes to your spouse on first death, that's fine in the sense of there's no inheritance tax because they're your spouse, so they're tax free. But you've just made them worth a lot more. So if, for example, you're worth 500,000 and they're worth 500,000, no inheritance tax when you die because it goes to the spouse. But then when they die, they're worth a million, assuming they haven't spent it. And that is then hit with inheritance tax. Uh, but there are transferable nil rate bands and so on, but that is very specific. So we would need to look at that. And I can obviously advise in more detail on that if relevant. But it's just thinking about if you've given everything to the spouse, they can spend it or they can leave it in their will to someone else who isn't who you want. So it's all to do with trust and control and the sort of balances in your priorities. So no client is ever the same. So that's where I mentioned earlier about protecting beneficiaries. So spouse having only a right to live in the house until they then die or remarry so that then, you know, that capital will go to your own children, for example, or vulnerable children. So even if they're adult, if they're vulnerable, do you protect it by way of a trust rather than, OK, son, here's 500,000 pounds and then they get befriend people. So there are things there to think about. You also need to cover in your will, what if I die second? So obviously you can change your will in the future. So if husband and wife sit there and say, well, we both want to say it goes to our children. 
you do have no guarantee that if you are then not the survivor, that your surviving spouse might well change their will and take up with a new person or leave it all to charity or whatever it might be. But we should cover it in the will because we don't know who's going to die when. And if you haven't changed your will, then you need to have covered it. And also thinking about a family wipeout. So if you say, well, I want it to go to my wife, then my children, fine. But what if, say, you're all traveling together, which with a young family is likely, who do you want to have it then? So do you want it to wider family or charities or friends? So you need to think about that. And then what is very important, but I've deliberately put it at the bottom, even though it's at the top of your will, is thinking about who your executors or trustees are going to be. And this obviously is better discussed and thought about after you've discussed and thought about, do you want any trusts? Because you may have conflict of interest if you had, say, um, a business assets trust. You, if you had the surviving spouse and, uh, for example, as um, the trustees or a good friend, shall we say, as trustees, your spouse is one of the potential beneficiaries. So obviously they're going to say as a beneficiary, well, I want the money, that's a good idea. But as a trustee, they need to wear a different hat and think about, well, is it a good idea? So that's obviously very crucial in terms of what you need to think about. And then just coming more to a close, but it is still really to do with wills and life, well, death planning, it is thinking about making gifts in your lifetime because there are inheritance tax consequences on when you do the timing of gifts or if you leave it all to your will. And obviously that's an individual decision. You could set up trusts in your lifetime as well. But often I have people who say, well, I want to give money to my adult child, but what if they get divorced? Well, if you want to maintain the control and protect the money, there really are two choices. Either you put the money into a trust for them during their lifetime, but that doesn't totally ring fence and protect. Or, for example, the child could have a pre or a post nup so that that money still is ring fenced. And hopefully that document would be binding if it was done properly. And I know that we have experience in our firm from the family team. They do pre and post nups and they could advise on that. You also need to think about for your death in service death benefits. And I know I'm sorry, I'm always being cheery because I'm always killing people off. But you wait till I talk about powers of attorney because I'm going to make you have no mental capacity. So apologies, I'm not that cheery. Um, but if you die whilst you're working, you might, for example, have a death in service benefit. Do you want to set up a trust now that those monies will drop into? Or with your pensions, if you die before you've fully drawn the monies down? Do you want to have that go automatically as a big check to your spouse or to your children? Or do you want to keep it in the pension wrapper? Or do you want it to go into a trust? So again, you've got kind of a family trust idea. So there's lots to think about. And more as clients get older, they ask me about care fees protection. But essentially, um, I know that some people think it's a great idea to give their house away to their children, for example, during their lifetime. And I'd say fundamentally, no, it isn't. It's a disastrous idea, but I could go on for hours about that, so I won't start ranting. But you can think about planning in your will with your share of the house. And that's that life interest idea, so the right for the spouse to live in it. But there is obviously a bit more to do with it. And I would say that any advice that I give, I'm very happy that it, I work and sit with financial advisor or accountant so that you get kind of everybody working together. So. I think, yes, that was bringing me to lasting powers of attorney. So I'm sorry it was very quick, but it needed to be. So, Yaz, I can't fully see everything and I haven't seen any questions coming in. Can you yeah. tell me if we have any questions? We do have one question. Um, I don't, can you not see the chat box? Do you want me to No, I can't do, sorry. No, that's fine. Okay, um, I've got a question from Ali. Uh, what happens if you have an aging parent with an out-of-date will and they may be or are not well enough to do a new one? Okay, so that obviously is always a consideration. At the end of the day, it is for your parent, so they have to do the new will. So let's just stay with that for now and Obviously, I mean, I'm used to seeing, I think my oldest client is 98 and she has come into the office and she likes the little outing as well. 
So if they are mobile, they can come to us. If they're not mobile, we can go to them. The key thing is, obviously not during COVID, we can do remote meetings during COVID, as obviously we're remotely doing this webinar. But the key thing is, do they have capacity? And there's very specific capacity tests depending on what it is you're trying to do. So for making a will, it's different to making a power of attorney or making a gift or getting married. So that's what we know about. And we would make sure we were happy that they had the capacity to do a will. So then they tell us what they want. We do it. Obviously, anyone else in the room, we ask to leave the room. So it's just us and the client because it must be what they want and not what anyone is making them. Not that obviously most children are making them do anything, but you understand the point. Um, if they don't have capacity and we say, I'm sorry, we don't think they do, then we can always get a medical opinion, but that has to have looked at the legal test for making a will, not just the doctor goes, oh yeah, they're fine. So we would need something a bit more detailed. But if they say, no, they don't have capacity, then you are either stuck with that old will or you can apply to the court for what's called a statutory will, but that costs a lot in itself. And also, unless you are, for example, saying, oh, well, there's a child that they didn't make provision for, it's unlikely that minor changes would be made or you couldn't cut someone out. So if you want to start doing care fees planning at that point, you won't be able to. The court will just say, no, all that money has to stay with the client. Um, and you can't, for example, say if you had elderly husband and wife start trying to do a life interest trust for the survivor, they'd say, no, keep it all simple. It all needs to go to survivor. So it is a lot better that the sooner anyone does a will, if they're starting or for their parents, they're worried about them, the sooner it's done. So we know they have capacity and they can do it, the better. So hopefully that's answered that point. Great. Okay, um, we've actually got a couple more questions now. Okay. Um, so uh, the next one's from Mary. Um, what is the difference between an LPA and general one? That I'll come on to if I may when I talk about powers of attorney. So shall I cover that next? Yeah, of course. Um, and then I've got um, a question from Jane. Uh, why don't they make it a legal requirement to make a will? Um, and why Prince Charles and not the Queen? I thought <laughs> it went straight to the government. Okay. Um, there is no, I mean, I would love it. It would be absolutely brilliant business for me if it was a requirement, but you can't force anyone to do anything because we know you can't force people to stay two meters apart, never mind spend money on getting a will. Um, God forbid they go to WH Smith and pay for a form because that, that gives us a lot more work when there are problems in the future. So I'm not recommending that, but there just is no requirement, but we do at least have the backup the intestacy rules otherwise everyone would just go well who's having this money they wouldn't know so we do at least have the backup so having heard the intestacy rules i'm thinking because of the question you understand why you need a will but unless people know about it then they don't understand why they do why prince charles i'm not sure the it is technically the crown who gets it but actually when you dig into it so it's not the government the government gets the money from us via taxation but it's the crown, but for some reason it's not the queen, it's Prince Charles. That, I couldn't tell you why it is, but anyway, he's the chosen one, so that's why it's him. So basically, do a will. Stop it going anywhere near them. Perfect, okay. Um, I think that's everyone's questions um, for that section, um, so happy for you to move on, Laura. Thank you. Well, if any questions do come through, I can always quickly cover them at the end of my session on powers of attorney too. So hopefully you can still see the slides. I'm hoping everyone's still okay. My broadband's all right. So what is, um, and I will, to start with, I'll answer lasting and general. A general power of attorney is kind of what it says on the tin, it's general. So it can only cover your finances. The maximum period is 12 months. And if you lose capacity during that period, it is invalid. So it's kind of just a general fixed thing. So it's a bit like a small plaster, if you like, put on a, a graze on your knee. A lasting power of attorney, again, it's a bit like the advert, the name is what it says on the tin. It lasts if you lose capacity. And I'll go through the two different types of, and I'll call them LPAs. 
I'll go through those to show you there's one for finance and one for health. But the difference is that it lasts, it's an unlimited period and it lasts for if you lose capacity. So the LPAs are totally separate from your will. Your will covers when you're dead, whatever happens. So if I did a will yesterday and I died today, my will deals with who gets my house, who gets my bank account, who gets my car. LPAs are totally separate, so don't confuse them. And they deal with during my lifetime, who do I appoint to deal with things for me? And again, I'll show you the differences between the two, but with the finance one, I do have um, an L, well, I have an old, what's an old called um, enduring power of attorney, because I did it before the forms changed and they've now become lasting powers. But essentially, I've got attorneys so that if anything happens to me, they can start acting. But actually, they have the power to act now. It's just that I've chosen people who um, I trust won't start doing things yet. But obviously, there's a whole conversation there. But essentially, with the finance one and with the welfare, health and welfare, you appoint attorneys. So I'll go into that in more detail as I go through. So it's for the rest of your life until you do a new form or you revoke the old one and do a new document to do new people. So, but it lasts if you lose mental capacity. So just going into more detail then about the finance one, this will give authority to deal with everything. So for example, withdrawing cash from the bank or dealing with your bank accounts generally, generally paying bills, selling your house, and exercising voting rights and obviously there's a point to do with do you have separate business lpa and personal finance lpa i'll come on to that shortly so we now have the system that you have to register it immediately and as soon as it's been registered and we are looking at long delays from the office of the public guardian at the minute which is why bizarrely we are finding our clients who have gone through the process of deciding who they want, we are doing general powers of attorney for them as well, so that if they want someone to deal with something, particularly clients who are in the vulnerable category, so elderly, who are housebound and cannot, are not supposed to leave their house, so even if they wanted to, they're not supposed to go to the bank to deal with something or go to the solicitor to sign something, they can appoint someone whilst their lasting power is going through the process with the Office of the Public Guardian because they've sent everybody home as well. So there are documents that are not being dealt with and we know that even though they're not telling us. So as soon as it's registered, which hopefully when we're back to normal is only 10 weeks, then it can be used. Um, but for finance, it is immediate. So unless you put a restriction that it's only when I lose capacity and there are very valid reasons for not doing that, it can be used. But it is of limited use for attorneys to make gifts because attorneys are not allowed to make the same gifts that you would as an individual to try and protect those assets for the benefit of the donor, the person who's given the power. So they do have limited gift use. So. The difference with the health power of attorney is it covers obviously health and welfare. So where you live, so whether you're at home or in a care home, who can visit you. And we do find that being used if you have people who prey on the vulnerable. I know it happened with my grandmother. We had to prevent someone coming to visit her in the nursing home because they were basically just stealing from her. Um, it's daily routine. But it is also decisions about life sustaining treatment, but it can only be used if you no longer have capacity. So the example that I give to people is I'm lying on a hospital trolley having had an accident and the doctor says to me, if we don't cut your leg off, you're going to die, you'll bleed to death. Now, if I've got capacity and they will obviously know that, I make the decision about whether you cut my leg off or not. And I might be stupid, in my well in their opinion say no you're not i want to die well that's up to me they can't touch me and it would be assault because i've said that now if i was unconscious because i was bleeding to death then they don't have anyone to ask um so if they said to say my husband they said well do you think she'd like that or what he actually has authority they don't have to talk to him at all but if he can wave my health power of attorney at them and go, excuse me, she appointed me, then that authority transfers to him. 
So if he says, no, you're not cutting her leg off, if he made that decision, then because I haven't got capacity to make it, he makes it and they have to listen to him. And actually doctors, and we find this from, we know from when we've talked to medical people, they prefer that the attorney has to decide about life-sustaining treatment, so switching the machine off basically, because Obviously, we hope that anyway it won't happen, but it's a lot rarer for us as individuals to do that than if every day I go on a ward and I have to say to grieving family, sorry, but there's no chance of recovery. Shall we switch it off? And they go, well, I don't know, you decide. Obviously, that's a decision that isn't really something that is, well, it's not nice that they're having to make it. Not nice for your attorneys either, but hopefully, as I say, it's more limited. Um, what happens if you don't make an LPA? For example, particularly with business owners and the person loses capacity, whether you're in a partnership or, for example, you have shares in a company, then no one can do anything. So unless you have other partners or other um, shareholders or directors who still have mandates on the bank account, for example, then the bank could freeze the business account. So that would mean invoices remain unpaid, Creditors would start suing, contracts are unfulfilled. So you can see that really there is something you can do, and that's the point of deputy, but it takes at least six to eight months. And by that point, where's your business gone? So if you don't have an LPA, no one has legal authority to stand in your shoes for once you've lost capacity. Or, for example, you don't have to have lost capacity. What if you go abroad on a business trip? Well, with an LPA in place, then whoever you've appointed can sign those documents, can deal with things. So it doesn't have to be that you lose capacity, which is why I say it's a valid reason not to do it only on lack of capacity. So I always say to clients, I know they're expensive, but think about them as a form of insurance. So I pay, for example, my house insurance and hope to goodness it doesn't burn down or get burgled. I still pay every year. In a way, it's like that with LPAs. They are a form of insurance. If I die and I never lost capacity or I never asked anyone to deal with anything for me, then it's a waste of money. But if I, for example, go abroad and I want someone to deal with something, unless I've got the LPA or in that case, a general power of attorney set up, no one can do that. Or if I have a stroke and I lose capacity or I, I lose the physical ability to hold a pen and to type on a keyboard, then I've already set up in place my backup, which is my attorneys. So they can act immediately, but you only appoint people who you trust who only act when you want them to. So as I say, regardless of family members or relationships, no one has authority without the LPA. So what if you don't make one, you have uncertainty. So it will be the court of protection who'll decide on the deputy. Will your business be run properly? And it does cost a lot more. And as I say, there's a delay with the deputies being appointed, which is months rather than weeks. And the whole process is basically a lot more complicated, expensive and takes longer. So there are also more duties on a deputy because it's not someone that you have chosen. So there are more duties, for example, to have insurance cover and submit annual accounts, which you might think, well, that's a good thing anyway it's an onerous responsibility so they might be less willing to take on the role so reasons to make one is peace of mind so they're there stored away for in the future you choose who deals with it um, you don't have to have an expensive court application and as i say they are a type of insurance so with businesses though um, let's just see if i've done yes so i've done a slide for business owners the question is, do you want one LPA or do you want two? Talking here about the finance one. And this is where well, I obviously appreciate time's running on, so I need to be quicker. So I Stuart won't get as long. So you can have one business or sorry, one LPA which covers everything. So you might, for example, have your spouse and then they can deal with your day to day banking. You're selling your house and all the rest of it. But are they the person you want involved in the business? And if the answer is no, you might say, right, I want two. I want spouse for personal. I want business um, shareholder, co-shareholder for the business. But then you need to think about actually, is it better that you have one document with both of them in where one can act without the other? Because if, for example, um, 
you have the spouse running up and down the stairs to look after you, do your nursing, are they going to have time to go to the bank? Or what happens if they die or become um, unable to look after things? So it may be a case, and it obviously is a very individual discussion, do you have two documents or you do you have one? And do you have two people in each one? So similarly though, you might say, well, my business partner isn't the right person to deal with my personal finances. So it really will depend. But with the business, obviously, aspect, you need to think about, for the attorney, who has the skill and knowledge? Who can actually run this business for me? Who can take these decisions? And you do need also to look at either the Mem and Arts or the shareholders agreement or the partnership agreement to make sure that the um, attorneys can act as directors or the partner duties rather than just um, day-to-day business decisions. So you need to make sure that you've covered everything and it isn't only the voting rights, for example, on shares. You need to make sure that your attorneys have the skill and knowledge to then step into your shoes. So the main thing is, though, appoint people you trust as well as people who are capable. So summary, and I will come for questions in a second on LPAs, make a will, make your LPAs, obviously I would say that, and seek specialist advice because this area is complex and it isn't just we want to get fees. We do want, obviously, clients to have thought about everything and covered everything they need to think about. So then you can just park those documents and get on with enjoying your life, albeit housebound, so to speak, in a minute. So are any questions on LPAs? And excuse me, Yasmin, I can't see my screen still. I don't think we've got any questions. Um, if anyone does have any, um, then um, please pop them in the chat and we'll um, answer them after. Lovely. Shall I stop sharing my screen so Stuart can do his? And I'm only one yeah. Over Stuart, so that's quite a result. <laughs> there yeah, we go. Do a quick right. switch. Right, thanks, Laura. Um, can everyone hear me first of all? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Now, next task is to see if I can uh, share my screen. Um, right. Let's have a go at this. Oh, hang on. Right, can people see the um, the slides? Yep. Great. Okay. Uh, right. Um, so yes. So I'm Stuart Coles. I'm a commercial property uh, solicitor at Thirstfields, and I'm um, just going to have a um, discussion today for a few minutes about a few of the issues that are um, facing business owners at the moment, um, with a focus on property-related matters. So um, we're going to be just very briefly touching on some of the financial support packages that are available at the moment. Not going to go into too much detail on, on that. Um, really looking more at how businesses are looking at reducing their overheads um, and obviously focusing on property related matters, business rates, rent negotiations. Um, the, the importance of documenting anything that you agree in terms of rent concessions. Um, look at other impacts of not paying the rent, or the repercussions that um, that you, you might not have thought about. Options available to landlords, and just a few other considerations for tenants and, and business owners. <coughs> so, I mean, obviously, everyone's being affected by things at the moment. A lot, lot if not pretty much all businesses are being affected in some way, um, find, hit, feeling the financial impact of COVID-19. Um, and the, one of the first questions business owners will look at is, um, how can we replace our lost revenue? And then how can we reduce our overheads? So in terms of cash for businesses and lost revenue, um, th th there's, the government have introduced a, a, a range of financial support packages. Um, I've listed some of the things there. There's a variety of grants, loans. It depends on the size of the business, the, the sector that you work in. A lot of businesses will already have looked into these, um, so I'm not gonna go into any great detail now. There's a link there for the government website with more information. Accountants are probably better placed to really advise on what's best for your business, what you're eligible for. Um, and yes, there's a lot of information out there on, on those. So looking, instead at um, how businesses are trying to reduce their overheads. Uh, often the first thing to, to go is um, 
employees and a lot of businesses have uh, taken on this um, the, the, the government's furlough scheme that has been introduced. We have um, employment lawyers who are experts in this area who can give further advice on that if, if anybody needs it. There's also tax and VAT deferral arrangements that are being introduced. Um, but as I say, I want to look at more the sort of property costs that people are looking to um, try, and, try and make savings. Um, so business rates and, and rent. So first of all, business rates, as people might may have heard, there's um, been some changes in, implemented with business rates scheme. I think we're going to see more changes. I think the whole and people have been calling for the whole business rates system to be overhauled, and this may well sort of kickstart that. But the first step is they've introduced a, a complete 100% um, exemption for uh, businesses in certain sectors, so retail, hospitality, leisure sectors, um, for the current tax year, 100% business rates exemption. So that's shops, restaurants, cafes, um, pubs, cinemas, hotels, things like that. It also applies to um, children's nurseries are also entitled to that exemption. So that will give certain businesses um, a bit of a, a saving, but a more problematic area has been payment of rent. And as you can probably guess, we've been inundated with questions from both landlords and tenants over the last few weeks. Tenants come into us saying, well, we, we can't pay our rent, what can we do? Landlords come into us saying, our tenants not paid the rent, what, what can we do? And looking at it from both sides. And we've seen a real variety of uh, responses from landlords because these, these conversations have been had amongst landlords and tenants um, throughout the country. I think most tenants have probably had conversations with their landlords about this. And we're seeing a real variety of, of responses. Some landlords are being very sympathetic. And we have actually seen examples of landlords saying, yep, yeah, we understand um, they'll give, give given a complete rent free period for maybe a month, a quarter, just not um, requiring payment of rent. That's probably the, the minority. More often we see landlords looking for a, a, some sort of compromise, maybe accepting a reduced rent initially, part being deferred, maybe a rent holiday with a payment plan um, agreed or, or, or to be set up going forward. Um, various different arrangements being put in place. Um, it's difficult to, to, to budget and think forward and try and work out a payment plan, but if you can, it, we are seeing different arrangements being considered. We're also seeing landlords saying that they're sympathetic, but ha having to say, well, look, we've got our own financial commitments. Um, we've got our own mortgages to pay. And yeah, I'm sorry, we, we still need the, pay, the, the rent to be paid. Um, privately, they might be thinking to themselves, well, there's not actually a lot we can do or that we want to do at the moment, but officially taking the line that, no, we still need the rent to be paid, so keeping their options open. We're also seeing some landlords, and there have been examples in the, the media of some landlords taking a very aggressive approach and say, not only saying to the tenants, no, we still expect rent to be paid, but actually we will take any possible action we can to force you to, to pay. And we'll look at what action landlords can take um, in a minute. So if you are able to agree some sort of agreement with the landlord, some sort of concession, whether it's maybe a rent holiday and a payment plan, I would certainly recommend that you get this formally documented. Don't just rely on conversations or emails. Um, you want to get it properly documented because First of all, you don't want landlords backtracking on anything that you've agreed or any uncertainty as to what's been agreed. You don't want to find that as things start to get back to normal, suddenly you think you've agreed something and landlords turn around and start taking action against you then when they, when they can. Um, so, so get it documented. Also, when we come to document these agreements, we can, we can look at not just the rent, we can sort of deal with other issues. Um, don't forget other costs under the lease, things like service charges. If you're a tenant of a unit on an industrial estate or a shopping center, the service charge can be quite a substantial cost. So when you're talking to a landlord and trying to negotiate a rent holiday, make it clear whether you're talking about just rent or service charge as well, and then include that when you're documenting it. And other considerations. So um, I've mentioned interest there. Most leases will allow landlords to charge interest on non-unpaid rent. 
So if you have agreed a maybe a payment plan, you could be spreading out the, the current quarter's rent over the next few months or several months or several years even. Can the landlord charge interest on that? Are you, are you, you know, if, if, if you want to agree that they're not going to charge interest, again, deal with that now, address it now, and get it documented. I mentioned break options there. Um, you, you may be in a position where you have exercised a break option in your lease and the break date's coming up, you've already served the notice, or maybe you're thinking of doing so. And it's important to check the wording of the lease and bear in mind that most um, leases will say that in order to exercise a break option, um, you, you can only do so provided there are no rent arrears at the break date. So if you've already served that notice and the break date is coming up, but at the moment you're not paying rent, even if the landlord isn't pursuing you for the rent and, and is okay with that, unless you've got something agreed, you, you don't want to end up finding that you get to the break date and you, you've lost the ability to actually exercise it because of these arrears. So think about the, the repercussions and the knock-on effect of not having paid the rent. Um, I've also mentioned side letters there. There are some tenants who have already agreed concessions with landlords or different agreements. Uh, you see this a lot with shopping center leases um, where maybe the lease says one thing for instance it might say rent is payable quarterly but you've agreed previously that you'll actually only pay it monthly and that's put in a side letter the side letters will usually say that this concession only applies for so long as there are no rent arrears so again if by not paying the rent now even if the landlord is accepting that have you in, uh, sort of invalidated previous agreements that you had in place in these side letters so again get it all addressed now get it documented so you don't inadvertently lose out on other things you may have agreed or may be wanting to uh, rely on elsewhere so what options are available to a landlord at the moment um, previously uh, a landlord would have a variety of options um, steps it can take if a tenant doesn't pay the rent if it's holding a rent deposit, it can dip into that and the tenant has to top it back up. Now that, that stays the same, that's unchanged. Previously, uh, a landlord would be able to forfeit a lease if the, if the tenant hasn't paid within a set period, normally 21 days or 14 days. Um, and that is something that the government have uh, prevented at the moment. So the Coronavirus Act came into force recently. And one of the things that that did was to prevent from the, for the period from the 26th of March to the 30th of June, landlords cannot take action to forfeit a tenant's lease for non-payment of rent. So, I mean, would a landlord want to do that anyway at the moment? They're unlikely to be able to relet the property at the moment, so it probably wasn't a, a viable option for many landlords anyway, but it's at least taken away that, that threat at the moment. But it is only a temporary measure. Um, so you've got to bear in mind that once we get to the 30th of June, and that, that date might be extended, but if it's not, once you get to that date, the landlord will have that ability to, to forfeit the lease again if there are arrears. So you know, don't just see it as, oh, I don't have to pay at the moment, that's okay, and ignore it. Think about what's going to happen when you, you, you might have to pay it later. I've mentioned here commercial rent arrears recovery. That's what used to be called distress or distraint, uh, basically sending in bailiffs. Um, there's a detailed process in place now that you have to follow. Landlords can still implement that um, for rent arrears, but the government have recently announced that they're going to bring in new measures that um, basically give tenants a bit more breathing space. Landlords can't implement that unless the rent is in arrears for more than 90 days, I think is going to be the new rule. Um, so again giving them a bit more breathing space. We have seen examples of some landlords taking quite a drastic action of issuing statutory demands on tenants for non-paid rent. So a statutory demand is a notice served on a company saying pay this debt now, if it's not paid within 21 days then the creditor can um, take action to have the uh, order to, to apply for the company to be wound up. Now again do landlords really want to be getting their tenants wound up? Maybe not, but um, some landlords, especially where they had quite big substantial tenant, tenant companies uh, who probably could pay if they were forced to, this was enough of a, a threat to, to make them pay. Um, 
and it's something that the government have tried to curtail or trying to with some new measures they're not going to stop landlords from being able to serve statutory demands but what they're saying is if a winding up petition goes to a court the court has to look at is the reason that the company didn't or couldn't pay the debt because of COVID-19 and if it is then there are protections for the tenant so um, again there are some protections in place at the moment in reality there's not a lot that a landlord can or would probably want to do in terms of taking action for non-payment of rent but that's only temporary tenants need to think about as things get sort of back to normal business starts to take on again and um, you know unless you've agreed with the landlord what's going to happen to these rent arrears when you're going to pay or if you have to pay at all that that debt still remains and landlords will still be able to take action in the future so just very quickly um a couple of other options or considerations um that i wanted to mention i've mentioned there um surrender now some businesses might think it's not worth me trying to negotiate a deal with a landlord i simply need to shut up shop and walk away from this property and it's worth being aware that if you were to physically hand back the keys to the, to the property to the landlord if the landlord takes those keys and does something to sort of acknowledge that the property is, is returned to the landlord and they accept the property back then they can be deemed to have accepted a surrender of the lease by what's called surrender of by way of operation of law and that means that the lease is terminated from that date it means that there's no more rent liability building up after that date it doesn't waive any existing arrears or any previous breaches but it means there's no further liability going forward um, so for landlords our advice is to be very careful about getting properties back our advice is if you're going to take the keys back maybe for security purposes or something make it clear to the tenant put it in writing say we're, we're holding on these to these keys just as agent for the tenant purely for security purposes make it clear in writing that the lease is not terminated and that the tenant remains liable so there cannot be any um any question of you having inadvertently accepted a surrender um, i've mentioned refinancing there um not really got any time to go into that but that's something a lot of companies are looking at banks are very busy at the moment talking to businesses trying to be helpful trying to find um different ways to, of uh, help, helping our businesses and there's a lot of different options out there and different lenders i've also mentioned just briefly there uh, utilizing pension scheme funds now this is something that we're seeing I, I see a few clients looking at where maybe the business is short on cash at the moment but they've been able to build up um, a reasonable amount in a pension scheme a sip or a sas and they're looking at ways to how can they release that money from the pension scheme into the company to, to, to help the company at the moment and pension schemes SIPs and SASs can own commercial property so that's one way that you know, if a, say the company owns the property at the moment you could sell the, the property from the company to the pension scheme remo releasing funds out of the pension scheme into the company so you, you, you still have the asset of the, of the property, it sits in the pension scheme, and you have some cash into the prop into the company. Now the company's still got to pay rent to the pension scheme, but at least it's ultimately still all your money, and um, it's releasing some money to, to help the business um, in the short term. There are other things you can do with pension schemes. SASs, not SIPs, but SASs can loan money to um, an associated company. So again, it's ways of looking at different ways that you can fund or release funds or obtain money for businesses and there are a variety of options that we can that we can help with so um to summarize i think i'd say the key thing is for tenants to to negotiate um try and get a deal don't just put your head in the sand and think oh it's okay landlords can't do anything we don't have to pay rent at the moment try and agree a deal get it documented um and look at not just um saving the rent but think about the repercussions of of not paying the rent look at all your options are there other options that might be better than not paying the rent or you know if, if that could have repercussions and planning ahead now that's as i say it's very difficult at the moment because we just don't know how long things are going to last where it's going it's difficult to budget 
but just I just want to reiterate that point about bear in mind that the rent arrears that are building up at the moment are not just going to go away you, unless you get the landlord to agree something you will have to pay ultimately or the landlord might start taking more action when they can and as I say the, the, the ideal thing is to get a, an, an arrangement agreed now get it documented so there's no issues and disputes going forward so I'll leave it there and um, again in, invite any questions if there, if there are any uh, yes okay. um, I don't think there's any questions um, if anyone does have any um, please remember just to pop them in the chat box um, I am going to hand back over to Laura um, for a moment. I know she wanted to add another point. Um, so if that's OK, I'll pass back over to Laura. Thanks, Yaz. Um, I was only going to add um, just a couple of points. Hearing Stuart talking about COVID, obviously I realised I hadn't particularly addressed COVID, but I would say that we are still able to do meetings with clients. We can just do them remotely using Zoom or FaceTime or whatever it might be. So that's not a problem. And in fact, that frees you up from your travel time. Well, that makes life a bit dull because you don't leave your front room. Um, but also in terms of signing documents, I mentioned that electronic signatures aren't OK. You can still manage even in lockdown to get documents signed. I, for example, walked around and sat on the drive of local clients of mine. They sat in their garage behind a table. We wore gloves. They had face masks. So the fact that my papers started to blow away and I got a bit wet is beside the point. But you can still manage signing. People use their neighbours. They do it through an open window. So it is still possible. Where there is a will, there is a way, believe me. So COVID is changing the way we work, but it's not stopping us work. So don't, I mean, if you've got time now to think about getting things in order or your clients do, then I'd say, great, do it now. It's slightly different, but it can be done. Thanks, Yaz. No problem. Um, I think um, that brings us to an end then. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to um, Stuart and Laura uh, for presenting to us today. Um, we've had some really nice comments in the um, in the box there. Um, so thank you guys. Um, if anyone does want to be put in touch um, with either of them, um, I'm happy to do so. Um, or I'm sure they'll be happy to leave their um, contact details in the chat box as well. Um, just quickly then before um, we close, um, we do have um, a couple more webinars coming up this week. Um, so tomorrow we've got our virtual networking and we've got a few spaces left on that if anyone would like to join. Um, and then next week um, we've got um, a webinar on maximising your sleep during the pandemic. Um, if you want to sign up to our um, newsletter, happy to do so. I'm just going to put our email address um, in the chat box there. Um, we can sign you up to our newsletter to receive those every Tuesday. Um, but other than that, thank you all for joining um, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, and thanks again to Stuart and Laura. Take care. Bye bye.